Lord Denning, I wonder if you can give me your thoughts on how far ahead the judges and the law and the lawmakers are of the public, who certainly in North America at the moment seem to be very anxious to bring back almost any form of punitive treatment, be it the rope, the lash, or sentence without parole. If you would take that as my assessment of the public mood, could you compare it to Britain, or could you tell me what you think of the public's reaction to progressiveness and civil libertarianism? Well, I don't know about the public or progressive. So far as the judges are concerned, as a rule, uh, they are behind public opinion and have to come uh, into step with it later on. The judges, by habit, are conservative-minded and do not necessarily act in advance of public opinion. But if you're speaking of capital punishment or hanging or the like, well, I've been involved in most of the debates in England on that matter. And at one time, I gave evidence before the Royal Commission, and I was in favour then of keeping capital punishment for murder most foul. And the Archbishop of the time, uh, Geoffrey Fisher, uh, agreed with me. That was some years ago. And nowadays, quite often, when we have these terrible cases of terrorism, kidnappers and the like, I feel, and the public feel, perhaps we ought to restore capital punishment. But I don't think we will. In other words, the lawmakers in this case, the liberals in its best sense, among the lawmakers, are much ahead, you might say, in their attitudes than judges like yourself or the public like me. Well, I don't know. The uh, lawmakers, so far as we are concerned, are parliament. And I don't see, even after those attacks which we've had, whether it's Lord Mountbatten or whatever it may be, I don't see capital punishment being reintroduced in England. We've had the, the discussions on the votes on a little while ago. Do you say that with regret? Yes, but I've had mixed feelings about it from time to time. My original feeling was what I've mentioned, capital punishment for murder most fell. But over the years, I was swayed by the moral outlook. Is it right that we should uh, do a thing, hang a man as a society, which none of us individually would be prepared to do or even to witness? Mm -hmm. And that's the moral uh, feeling which I have. And I was eventually swayed, eventually in the debates in the House, Swensley swayed by that moral argument. This is not a legal argument. It's a matter of policy and public policy. But surely there comes a time which might well be seen in the Western democracies yet to come, not to mention the IRA or troubles we might have in this country, when for the protection of society it will be essential to bring back capital punishment. Well, I understand that point, point of view and uh, I doubt whether it will succeed. It's my own feeling instinctively is that way. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it'll happen in our time, in my time. One of your favorite sayings, which is quoted often in clippings I've read about you, there can be, without religion, there can be no morality. Without morality, there can be no law. That's right. Uh, would you care to tell me what you regard uh, to, as the state of today's public morality in terms of widespread permissiveness the breakdown of the family, the breakdown of marriage. Yes, well, I'm old-fashioned in this way, that I'm against this present permissiveness and the present lackness and the present breakdown of marriage, because to my mind, marriage is the essential to bring up the youngsters in the proper way they should go, and a happy and sound family life is one of the groundworks of our civilized society. But are you not the man who would give to a common law arrangement the full division of the spoils and give the common law unblessed marriage the full legal entitlement of those who have gone the way of the church. Oh no, I haven't got as far as that yet. You uh, haven't? Hadn't come. So far as husband and wife are concerned, we've done a great deal to show that there should be equal sharing of the matrimonial home and of the assets, the family assets, which they've contributed together to form and to read. But uh, outside that, I haven't gone as far. 
And I haven't gone as far, if you see what they call a common law wife now, being not being married. We have it every day in our courts, so the common law wife, isn't she entitled to this, that and the other? I haven't gone as far as that yet. I still feel very strongly there's a great deal in upholding the sanctity of marriage. Mind you, in this country we have really gone as far as to make the common law wife under provincial regulation after two years or something, entitled to almost everything the married woman gets. Yes, we have. Oh, you've gone further now, but why? Under the Family that? Relations Act. And we now are going to have the official divvying up of the spoils 50 50. Do you already, between married couples, do you already have that in England? Yes, we, well, it was subject to some modifications and so on, but uh, it may not be 50 percent. But that is the general rule, uh, getting that way. I agree as to that. But I'm surprised at your saying that what they call the common law wife, who's not a real wife at all, uh, but a mistress, as we'd say in the old ones, that uh, we haven't gone as far as giving her a share in the spoils yet. Well, we have, sir. Oh, not me, not in my court. I'm not a lawyer, but it's in the books and it's being done now. <laughs> no, but, well, we, we've started the way to protect her from being exploited, so to speak. We have done something. When she's been uh, living with him, having family by him, we've done something to protect her position. Mm -hmm. And I've not gone so far as to make her equal to a married woman. We got away from my point about morality, of course. Who is supreme in the law? I know the answer, but I must put it to you after an experience you had with your Attorney General. Who is supreme in the law? Is it the judge or is it the Parliament? Well, Parliament makes the laws. The judges interpret them. And in a way, by interpreting, the judges have a good deal of say who is the ultimate arbitrator. But in the case which you put of the Attorney General, there I thought we did what was right. Perhaps I should put in there, for the benefit of viewers, that a citizen in England had taken some action against the Attorney General for stopping mails to South Africa. That's right. And he came to you. Yeah. What was your attitude, sir? Well, I, or, uh, they wanted to stop the mails to South Africa, and our own parliament had enacted the law that anyone who impeded or hindered the mail was guilty of a criminal offence. And therefore, at the request of an ordinary citizen, we granted an injunction in the very terms of the parliamentary statute, which I thought was right. And it, one day, the trade union gave in. The mails were not stopped. But later on, Parliament said we were wrong. We oughtn't to have done it at the request of an ordinary citizen. It ought to be left to the Attorney General if he'd do it. And he never did. What you're saying, therefore, is that uh, Parliament, of course, is supreme. Yeah. But in the meantime, it's the duty of a judge to interpret the law for the benefit of the ordinary man. Yeah, but I would always say so. Some people say go by the letter of it, but I never do. By the precedent. I, I, I go by the, what I call the spirit of and the intendment of the law uh, as properly understood. And if they want to knock you down later by changing the law, that's let, their business. Let them do it. Let, let what was it you told the Attorney General, sir? You never so high the laws above you. Uh, but uh, there, there it is. Oh, yes, I was quoting an old chap long for, Oh, yes, I told that to the <laughs> Attorney General. And I hope we got away with it, but the House of Lords said, oh, no. Yes, yes. Do you sit in the House of Lords, too, by the way? Uh, yes, I mean, I have time. Anyway, yeah, well, you uh, don't sit... Well, I, <clears throat> of course, always sit as a legislator, and uh, I can go and sit as a judge in the Supreme Tribunal if I have time, but I'm much too busy with my own court. Yeah, and you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have a vote, though, as an ordinary citizen, because you're one a lord and two you're a master of the rules. Yes, I, I, I haven't a, a vote for a member. As a mem I am a member of Parliament. Yes. I'm a member of the House of Lords. Can you vote? I, on an on a act? Oh, yes, on a bill in Parliament, yes. But uh, I can't vote for an ordinary general election for a member of Parliament. But is that not a conflict of interest, said Webster, impudently, for the master of the rules, who's also a lord, of course, being able to vote to make laws which he interprets? Oh, well, I don't know about that. We have a lot of odd things in, uh, in our constitution, but that certainly is all right for us to vote on a law and, uh, and, and then to have the act afterwards to deal with it. Oh, yes. Tell me, sir, I, I would never attempt to bring you into Canadian politics, mm -hmm. but from the depths of your vast experience, what is the right way for judges to be appointed? 
If you were right, how, uh, how should judges be chosen and appointed in our kind of democracy? Well, so far as we are concerned, so far as the judges of the High Court are concerned, it's done on the recommendation of the Lord Chancellor. So far as people like me are concerned, it's done on the recommendation of the Prime Minister. And there's a good deal of inquiry goes on, consultation before an appointment is made. But nowadays, I'm glad to say, no political influence whatsoever. I don't know whether it's the same in Canada, but we've got a convention now that the judge is only to be appointed on his merits, on his ability to do his work, and not on his political views at all. Is it as, uh, I think you said the Prime Minister appoints senior judges. Yes, right. There'll uh, be a committee of cabinet, therefore, that will pick the judges. Yes. Or are they guided by the profession? Yes. Oh, well, it wouldn't be a guess. It's really the, the, the Prime Minister, but there, there have been instances lately when a Labour, a Conservative government would appoint a prominent Labour man as a judge. And it's happened one way or the other lately. I think we've yet to see that in this country. Yeah. Perhaps you're ahead of us in that. Sir, the powers of bureaucracy. Now, you are the chief judge at the moment of all civil appeals in That's Britain. Right. The Lord Chief Justice does the criminal appeals, I do the civil appeals. Right now, well, one gets the feeling that bureaucracy, if anything can destroy democracy, it will be the abuse of bureaucratic powers. Does that come through to you in England at all, that kind of... Oh yes, we do have, be, lately in the last ooh, half a dozen years, we've had many cases in which it comes to the question, have the ministers or the government exceeded or abused their powers? And the case which might interest you is Freddie Laker with the Skytrain. He wanted to put Skytrain into the air across the Atlantic. The minister said no, he had a prerogative and could refuse and did refuse. Freddie Laker brought that case to the courts. We held that the minister had no such prerogative as he claimed. He was exceeding his powers and we ordered therefore in effect the minister had to give way. Freddie Laker Skytrain crossed the Atlantic and has revolutionized air travel. That's all the result of the decision of our court holding the minister had exceeded his powers and abused them. There might be a hundred other instances of bureaucratic abuse under which people are presently lying quietly because they don't know they could be overturned. Oh, quite. Yes, well, it's gradually being developed, but the doctrine is certainly established in England's law that the courts can inquire into the powers of a minister, and if they are abused or misused, the courts can and do correct them. Uh, one of your famous cases, of course, is you're the man who changed the law of contract, are you not? Well, some of the students say that. Well, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I must one, be. A student wrote to the Times a little while ago when they were published and published this little, and they published it, and he said, Sir, with respect to the master of the rules, will his lordship kindly refrain from changing any more laws before the law examinations <laughs> in August? So they say I change the law, but I don't know whether I do. But at all events, I do what I can to keep it in step with the needs of the times. Yeah, but how can you go against precedent and a thing like that, sir? Pretend I'm a, a stuffy old constitutional judge of some kind, and I look at this master of the rules who goes by common sense and not precedent. So yes, you're no. upsetting the apple cart. Oh, I, I upset a lot of people like that, because I say the doctrine of precedent can be tarried too far. As I told you before, lawyers are very conservative. They like to stick by the previous precedent. Well, if that precedent has turned out to be wrong, I say the judges ought to be able to depart from it. And uh, that's all I've said. Can you give me, for the benefit of lay people, can you give me an example of how you would apply that common sense instead of precedent? Oh, well, uh, in a sense, I could go where you talked about husband and wife and all that sort of thing. Thirty years ago, I had a case where a husband had deserted his wife. The house was in his name. Deserted his wife and then uh, was living with his new mistress and said, well, it's my house. He claimed it against the wife whom he's deserted. It came before me, and under the old law, he was right, the master below it ordered the wife out. But I said I wasn't going to have it. 
I got a hold of some old statutes and things, and I said no. The, the, the husband's duty uh, to have a roof over his wife's head, and I said he hadn't got a right to turn her out. The courts had a discretion, so there we are. We did change the law. We and were, since that time, judges that, have yeah, taken the discretion. Yeah, that's right. And that because, so there we are. And that's the instance of how uh, it depends on the judge. Some people are unwilling to do it, mm. but uh, and a lot of people are still not. But I'm hoping that we should gradually say, well. President, if it's wrong, we ought to be able to depart from it. Yeah. In this country, we are often worried by the extensive time that cases and trials take. Mm -hmm. Have you found any way to cut down these incredible, lengthy litigation it, trials? It, it, it's a problem, not only if it's in Canada, but with us, and I think everywhere. In every country of the world now, we have nearly all of these backlogs of cases. We used to have our criminal trials come on within eight weeks of the committal. Now they've gone into months and months very often. In civil cases, I used to get them on in appeals in my court within three or four months. Now they may be eight or twelve. It's the, somehow the enormous backlog and increase of cases, which is one thing, and the length of time the lawyers take over them is another. Ah, well, this is the point I was going to say. Uh, lawyers today, you passed your law exams in eight months, didn't you? Eight months study. <laughs> yes, that's quite right. And you, you were a lawyer. Yes. Here they forced them to go to school for an arts degree about six or seven years. That's Is right. that not nonsense? Well, I think they ought to be able to get through it quicker, but still there we are. That's not on the length of cases, that's on the length of training. Well, length of training may well affect the length of cases. <laughs> Maybe. Like the standard of training may well affect. Mm -hmm. What about the caliber of today's lawyers in Britain? Is it as good? Or is it anyone can now be a lawyer from any no, red brick I, university? I think I, one's always ten when one's get older to think with the previous time. No, I think our youngsters are still very good, both uh, in, the, in the profession, the law society and at the bar. No, they still used to be very good. I, I, I'd uphold them on that. They really are good. They almost try to be almost too careful and go too much into detail sometimes. <laughs> Lord Denning, in one of your famous inquiries, which shall remain nameless, <laughs> if people can't I guess. I guess that you're talking, going to talk about Profumo. Yes, yes. You made a very strong observation that something should be done to stop the trafficking in scandal for rewards. That's quite right. Uh, could you, could you broaden that, tell me what you really meant by saying that, first of well, all? Well, that is in the case where the newspapers will pay the participants in misconduct money for their story. In that case, there was a letter written, the darling letters we called it, written by the Secretary of State for War, and uh, a newspaper, I think, had paid £5,000 uh, for, the, for the letter and kept it in their files ready to use on important occasions. Well, that is just one instance, but it's widespread today. I don't follow, haven't all have followed all the recent cases. It happened it, in the other. It's, it's arising again today. And um, you know, as you will know, in the recent case, the Thorpe case, there was the question whether a witness was going to be paid so much for the story if the man was convicted, but much less if he was acquitted. Well. It seems to me that is a complete misuse or wrongdoing on all sides. And uh, the, the journalists uh, involved, well, I, I emphasized it in the Perfumer case, something ought to be done to do this trafficking in scandal. But you have the power to do something, sir, don't you? Have I? Well, that I don't mean you, sir. The law, but, but the law is, we've got a press council in England, which can advise on it, but it's got no powers except sort of advisory. But if I'm going to run a scandal sheet newspaper and pay my story for some participant in a big scandal, I don't give a dash what the press council is going to do to me, do I? I'm afraid that may happen. Do you think there should be a law to I stop this? Yes, well, it's been after the recent case, then uh, there have been suggestions in Parliament for a bill uh, to stop uh, the trafficking uh, of this kind for a war. Is there not sufficient remedy, and you're very strict in the British courts, or the English courts, very strict application of uh, 
slander and defamation laws, libel laws? Uh, yes, but uh, in many cases they don't touch it, you see. If what is said is true, the libel and slander case, uh, cases don't touch it at all. It's complete defense in a civil case in libel to say what I said was true. And if I, produce, if I buy a letter, and it's a true letter, and it's published, unless you can stop it on the ground of privacy, uh, I don't know if you can stop it at all. But at the same time, sir, is it not good that we have scandal-mongering newspapers? Right. Is it not good that we have them? Otherwise, the establishment in any, either of our countries would feel much secure, much more secure in burying well, I, scandalous I, 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 situations. I, I, that is the other side, and I think there's quite a lot in that, that in a way, uh, supposing wrongdoing is done, it may be in the public interest that it should be exposed, and that the newspapers should do it, and the people shouldn't be able to cover themselves up uh, in that way. Oh no, the pub that's why I've been very much in favor of a great deal that the newspapers, the freedom of the press is very important. Did it, was it not best shown in one of your big British Sunday papers, which against the strictures of the courts, broke the story on the difficulties in getting settlements on the thalidomide cases? Yes, well, we had all that uh, that case there. Well, was we that had, in front had, of you? Had, had the Sunday Times case, which we had, which uh, in my court we would have held and did hold that the article saying that distillers were probably negligent, that that was we had it was not a contempt of court, but the House of Lords said it was because it was done to bring unfair pressure on distillers to pay up. There's a difference of opinion between my court and the House of Lords. You said it was not a contempt? No, no, we said it was not a contempt. It was a matter of high public interest, and the newspaper was entitled to make fair comment upon it. And the House of Lords reversed you? Yeah. Was the, was the time stuck for money or just the um, punishment? Then the, uh, no, no, but, uh, well, no, that was contempt of court. But the interesting thing is we finished that story. Yes, please. The Sunday Times took that to the European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg. And by a majority of 11 to 9, uh, that court upheld the view which my court had taken that it was justifiable to print and publish that article as being fair comment on a matter of public interest. A great moral victory, but surely the decision of the European Court of Human Rights? Yeah. That has no legal strength no, 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 in Britain, no, 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 has it? Doesn't, it doesn't affect the House of Lords, no. It doesn't, doesn't affect our law as such, no. But it gave the Times a moral victory. Yes, that's right. Well, it does. Uh, it may lead the way to a reform in the law. In other words, it may nudge the Lords and the Commons to yeah, be a little yeah, more... Yeah. And I don't know whether possibly the House of Lords can reconsider things, man, whether it possibly in a later case it may reconsider, but I doubt that. I think it may need legislation. Uh, you mentioned of the European Court of Human Rights. Yeah. Do you think that, uh, therefore, in the next 20 or 30 years, that uh, the court systems in Europe will become kind of what, all in one, and we shall have equal standards? Well, well we are getting not, uh, not altogether that way. We've got the European Court of Justice of our common market, nine common market countries, which can interpret the Treaty of Rome for us. We've got this court at Strasbourg on the Convention on Human Rights, European Convention, which can give interpretation of that convention. And gradually, we won't be under a whole European court, but it will have great influence on our law. Well, sir, you, have, you are the longest-serving judge in any English-speaking country. Is that correct? Yes, I think 35 years. You'll find it difficult to find anyone else. And you must be a little touch over 60 years of age. Yes. Well, the others have got to retire at 75 now in England. Not what? me. Why not? Because I was appointed before the new act came in. So... Do you know what they begin to say about me now? No. Every Christian virtue except resignation. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are, so we keep on. Lord Denning, Master of the Rolls, who out of his own mouth says he has every, or they say of him, he has every Christian virtue except that of resignation. He is now in his 80th year. A couple of things that I'm not going to forget from this, because I'm a bit of a square myself and not, uh, perhaps not quite as much of a civil libertarian as Lord Denning. 
where there is no religion, there is no morality, and where there is no morality, there is no law. And the other thing, of course, good lesson to learn, especially when one is dealing with attorneys general, and especially, of course, if you're the top judge in the land, be you never so high, the law is above you. Far be it from me to suggest any local application of such a an aphorism, Doug? Is that an aphorism? What is that? A mo, I would call it. A mo. <laughs> yeah. A bon mo. Yeah, right. A yeah. bon mo.